Well, good morning, Pantano. Hey, so I want to welcome... All right, that's enough of that. That's enough of that. Somebody said, are you doing a funeral today? Uh, Maybe yours. Be careful. All right. Um, That's just a joke. It's just a joke. Hey, I want to welcome some folks with us online right now. We've got Benita uh, from South Dakota. Her niece was just baptized this morning, uh, which is really, really cool. Uh, We've got Brady watching from Reno, and we've got Kevin watching from Oklahoma. Would you welcome our online campus this morning? So glad you guys are with us. And then also before we dive in, we're finishing this series called Seismic Shifts today, uh, and we're talking about epicenters of empowerment. And I can't think of any better day, any better topic um, to just celebrate our veterans in the room. Would you do me a favor? If you're a veteran uh, in our room, would you just stand where you are? I just want to recognize you this morning. Thank you for your service. From the bottom of my heart, I come from a long line of veterans in my family, and I just, I can't even begin to thank you for um, just your service. Uh, So thank you, thank you very much, and uh, I know that's just a very small token of thanks, uh, but I do want to recognize the sacrifice and the service that you guys have made. Um, So we have the freedom to do what we're doing right now to be able to worship together um, and, and do what Christ has called us to do. So, so with that, um, we've been in this series called Seismic Shifts, and we've been looking at what it means uh, to be the next wave of earth-moving mission for the church and this generation uh, around the world. And we've had this overwhelming opportunity to see the world around us as like this tectonically moving force and shift for Jesus Christ. And every time I have seen or I've heard about the earth moving, I I don't know if you pay attention to these kind of, like I'm kind of enthralled when when these kind of things take place. When the earth moves, it makes me stop and pay attention. I don't know about you. And, And there's this word that's always front and center when you hear about the earth moving, and it's this word epicenter. Like we've all heard the word epicenter, right? And this word epicenter, I did a little Google search. By the way, Google's this thing where you can like type things in. And it tells you stuff. I'm glad I didn't have that in school because I would have passed by Google, not by learning, right? But there's a working definition that I love for this word epicenter. Here's what it means. A point directly above the true center of disturbance from which the shock waves of an earthquake radiate. All right, let me read it again. A point directly above the true center of disturbance from which the shock waves of an earthquake radiate. Radiate. May 22nd, 1960, the most powerful earthquake recorded in history took place. It was a magnitude 9.5 that struck southern Chile. Uh, the rupture zone stretched an estimated 311 miles to almost 621 miles along the coast. The event was named after the city most affected by the quake. It's a, uh, the Valdivia earthquake. And it left 2 million people homeless, injured at least 3,300, 3, and killed approximately 1,655 people. In fact, the economic damage back then was $550 million, or if you adjusted it for today, $4.8 billion worth of damage. That earthquake triggered what was known as a massive tsunami that raced across the Pacific. And those waves uh, wreaked havoc on the coastal communities as far away as New Zealand, Japan, and the Philippines. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, and when I read that, every article said that the epicenter of the 9.5 earthquake, the epicenter, set off a chain reaction that was a global event. A chain reaction, it was a global event because it didn't just affect Chile, it affected communities almost 11,000 miles away with the aftershocks and the shockwaves. That epicenter sent shockwaves across the globe. And while the epicenter is where the power starts, it's the shockwaves from the epicenter that cause the chain reactions and global events. It's the epicenter of power that changes communities locally and globally. And it got me thinking about the church, about us, 
about what we claim and who we are. Actually, it really got me thinking about us here at Pantano. Like if we're truly going to see a seismic shift in the lives of people for Jesus, it's going to start with an epicenter of power sending shockwaves out from this place. That, that we would move to the point that we, we go into neighborhoods, we go into communities, we go into schools, we go into workplaces. Everywhere that we go, we are a shockwave from the epicenter of power. You may be thinking, well, okay, that sounds great. And epicenters have power. So where does that power come from? Well, I'm glad you asked that question today. Because the greatest epicenter of power comes from one place. Actually, it comes from one name. That name is Jesus. Like, do you realize there is power in the name of Jesus? Do we understand that? Like, at the very name of Jesus, when he returns, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And so when we utter the name Jesus, you don't have to even scream it. You can just say, Jesus. And there's power in the name of Jesus. Like demons in Scripture, if you read Scripture, they actually shudder at the name of Jesus. Why is it that the demons know to flee, but yet some of us, we just keep hanging around? So I want to start something today before we dive into Scripture. I just want to bring a little power to the room. So on the count of three, I just, I just want you to probably in your best like Pentecostal charismatic crazy voice. <laughs> now, if you don't know what that is, welcome to church. <laughs> but on the count of three, I just want you to scream that name, Jesus. Now, wait for it, because I know some of y'all are going to get a little zealous, and you're going to go on one. All right, just get, get to three with me. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Jesus! Woo! That was all right. No, no, no. That was okay. <laughs> but I, I got to drive to Phoenix today. And I'd really like them to hear this up there. So let, let's just try it. And there's a reason for it because if we're going to send shockwaves, we've got to understand the power that's in the name. So just one more time, just humor me, okay? You may be new and you're like, this is so weird. That's okay, I promise. We'll dive into some other stuff, all right? But on the count of three, I just want you to give me that name again. One, two, three. Yeah. I, I felt that in my soul. Like, that's like bass in those cars that drive by. Like, that was seismic. That's a, that's a shockwave moment. Like, the shockwaves of that name will go into your neighborhood, your communities, our county, our state, our country, seismically across the globe. If we really believe that there is a seismic power in the name of Jesus, we can change the world. And as we talked about last week, it's out of the pain of where we are that leads to praise to help others move beyond. I shared stories of my friend praising God through the, the loss of their 10-year-old daughters and, and how it's not just reached their communities, but now it's crossing borders and now their stories are going across the globe and, and people are watching them praise in their pain through Jesus and there's power and there's a shockwave that is going through the world because of those stories. People are being changed because the epicenter of power that comes when we move towards those in deepest need. And here's what I long for. I long for Pantano to be a place that is an epicenter of empowerment that sends shockwaves of God's hope and transformation to all of our communities and beyond. That's my prayer for our church. And you know why it's my prayer? Because that's been the prayer since this church started. This church is 60 years of being an epicenter of empowerment. So, so let me ask you, what about you today? How do you become an epicenter of empowerment? Well, honestly, use your story to impact the stories of others. It's that simple. It's really that simple. Step out in faith and share how you have been transformed. You know what's great about your story? Nobody can refute your story. They can try. But guess whose story it is? Yours. They can choose to reject it, but you know that if you've really been transformed, you can't help but tell people about that transformation. Last week, we had 33 people get baptized last weekend. How amazing is that, by the way? I met three different people last week getting baptized that were getting baptized while their one was getting baptized. 
They invited their one. Their one showed up and was like, hey, I need to do that. And then their one was like, why haven't you done that? And they're like, I don't know. Let's do it together. You see what happens when you get intentional about just simply loving people where they are. How does that happen? When you believe that God wants to use you as an epicenter for your community, your neighborhood, your school, your work, your sphere of influence, you begin to journey with people in a new way. You help them find Jesus. And can I tell you that when you're one comes and you both get baptized and you both get in community and you both serve others and you both look for more ones, can I tell you what it does? It tectonically and seismically shifts the world in which you live in ways that you could never imagine. And you might be thinking to yourself, so how do I find this empowerment to send shockwave? Well, well, I want to look at the last three chapters of the book of Acts today. I know some of you just went, we're looking at three chapters? We are. And you're thinking, how long are we going to be here? For a minute, but we're going to look from 30,000 feet, okay? I want you to actually go read the last three chapters of the book of Acts this week, um, but I want to take a 30,000 foot view and see how Paul actually was an epicenter of power. In fact, I want you to write this down as we start today because this is the very core of where I think we need to go to understand this, and it's just simply this, opposition is our opportunity, I'm going to say that again. Opposition is our opportunity. If Jesus is the epicenter of power, then he's the power in opposition. He's the only way we get through opposition. So go to Acts chapter 26, and Paul is on trial. In fact, he's in front of Agrippa and Festus. By the way, I'm glad we've moved on to some better names in history than Agrippa and Festus. Because when I hear Festus, I think Uncle Fester, and then it really does some weird things to me. (laughs) Welcome to my mind, y'all. That's a little weird. I'm not going to lie. These are big-time leaders. Just so you know, King Agrippa, uh, he actually was a Jew by nationality, but he sided with the Romans. He knew the Jewish culture, but was a Roman by all other views. So listen to how Paul confronts this opposition. Remember, he's on trial. Paul's really smart. And as I love this, uh, verse one, uh, so Paul gesturing with his hand started his defense. Now, I don't know what kind of gesture he made. I kind of want to know. I want to know if he was like, la, 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 spirit fingers. I don't know what he did, but he gestured. He did something. I don't know if he thumbs up him. I don't know what he did. But it had to be something good because verse two, I am fortunate, King Agrippa, that you're the one hearing my defense today. Against all these accusations, Made by the, what kind of leaders? What's he say? The Jewish leaders. For I know you're an expert on all Jewish customs and controversies. Now, now please, listen to me patiently. Does anybody else feel like he's buttering the king up a little bit? Like, I love this. He appeals to King Agrippa's vanity and pride. He butters him up a little bit to plead his case. Paul knows he's in front of this opposition to the good news that he is preaching. He knows. He knows in this moment, this could be life or death for Paul. He understands this. This isn't like maybe you go to jail for a few weeks. This is life or death, the trial that he's on. And it could go sideways at any moment. Yet Paul understood as he has his entire ministry that opposition is our opportunity. He understood it. Opposition is our opportunity. Jesus is the epicenter of power in opposition. And so every time Paul has been opposed... Every time somebody's gone against the hope and the good news that he is preaching, God has given him a bigger opportunity for kingdom impact. So can I just tell you, if you're here today and you're like, everywhere I turn, I find opposition, then get prepared because God's about to do something big with you. In fact, I would argue if you don't have opposition in your faith journey, maybe you haven't really leaned into your faith journey. Because every time Paul found opposition, God gave him greater opportunity. And Paul, in this text, he begins to to share his pedigree as once being a Jew of of all Jews, a Pharisee of all Pharisees. He was the opposition to Jesus. Do you remember that about Paul? Like he was Saul and then he became Paul. And so now I love what verse 6 says. He says, now I'm on trial because of my hope in the fulfillment of God's promise made to our ancestors. To our ancestors. Like he's making this appeal to the king. And he's saying, basically what he's saying, he's like, really? Now you're going to put me on trial for bringing hope to people? I mean, think about that. You're out feeding people, helping people, 
providing finances and resources to, to, to get people in a better way of life. And then somebody comes and arrests you and goes, yeah, you can't do that. Does anybody else think that's absurd? Well, that's what Paul's up against in this moment. It's almost as if, as if Paul is baffled that anyone would be against hope. By the way, I don't know about you, but it seems a little absurd when anybody's against hope. Like when any of us push against hope, why would we push against hope? Jesus says that he is the hope of the world. And yet when we push against it, we're pushing against Jesus. And he reminds him that this is what the Jews have been waiting for. I love this. Paul says to him, he's like, hey, by the way, this is what our ancestors, our ancestors have been waiting for there, Agrippa. Like Jews believed in the power of God. They preached that their ancestors experienced it. In the Old Testament, Paul even questioned the opposition more in verse 8. Listen to him, he goes, why does it seem incredible to any of you that God can raise the dead? Isn't that a funny question? He's like, hey, Agrippa, weird question. Like if you believe the power of the God of the Old Testament that, that you claim, that you know, then why are you surprised that people are raising from the dead? Like Paul's so smart here. He, he knows what they know. He was, he was actually, he's lived how they lived. He, he was speaking to the heart and to the core of his opposition, trying to remind the king what the king has known his whole life. Then in the midst of opposition, Paul does what I think is an amazing lesson to us all. His story is the epicenter of God empowering him. And so after this moment, Paul begins to share his life. He does exactly what I think we should be empowered to do, is share our story. So Paul just begins to share his story. He talks about how he was the opposition, and then God changed him to be the opportunity. Like some of you have been the opposition, and God's like, that's fine. You've been the opposition, but I'm going to use you now to be my opportunity for those that are the opposition. Paul's like, that was me, Agrippa. Like, Agrippa, you're trying to be the opposition. And I'm just telling you, I was the opposition. Now I'm God's opportunity. He talks about his conversion that we looked at a few weeks, a few weeks back. He talked about Jesus confronting him and blinding him. He talks about Jesus giving him an opportunity and that there would be opposition. Like when he gets called, Jesus is like, yeah, there's going to be some messed up stuff happening to you, Paul. He talks about Jesus calling him to the Gentiles. Which, by the way, um, if you're not a Jew, guess what you are? You're a Gentile. If you're not a Jew, raise your hand real quick for me. Gentile. <laughs> quick lesson for you. Okay, you're a Gentile if you're not a Jew. I, I, and so Paul is called to go to the Gentiles. By the way, if Paul doesn't go to the Gentiles, I don't know who God sends, but we may have a different look than we do right now if Paul's not called to go to the Gentiles. And, and then he tells the king that he's doing nothing more than what Jesus called him to do. Isn't that interesting? He's like, I'm just doing what I was told. I'm a good Jesus follower. I'm just doing what he told me to do. Then listen to this exchange, verse 22. But God has protected me right up to this present time so I can testify to everyone from the least to the greatest. I teach nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen. By the way, that's him Old Testament talking to Agrippa right there in case you're wondering. He goes that, that the Messiah would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead and in a way announce God's light to Jews and Gentiles alike. And then suddenly here comes Festus. By the way, if your name's Festus, I feel like this is your personality right here. Fest is like, Paul, you're insane. Too much studies made you crazy. Like, he doesn't say anything to this point, and then this is where he chimes in. And I love Paul. He goes, I'm not insane. Most excellent Festus. Now, the spiritual gift I have is sarcasm. <laughs> so I feel like maybe me and Paul have a little bit in common. I feel like maybe I can't prove this. I've looked a lot in the Greek to find whether or not excellent right here was very sarcastic. I think there's like an exclamation point or something, but he goes, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is the sober truth. And in the midst of opposition, Paul doubles down on the truth of Jesus. He doesn't run from it. Like he doubles down. I love this in this moment. He, he, he knows that this could seismically shift the world and all who hear it could be changed. He also knows that death and imprisonment is a possibility. You know what I love about Paul? is death and imprisonment doesn't scare him nearly as much as not being obedient to what God's called him to. He's like, you can kill me, you can imprison me, I'm not scared about that. What I'm scared about is if I don't tell you about the hope of Jesus and use that epicenter of power that comes through the name of Jesus to help change your life, I'm more scared of what might happen to my eternity than I am my temporary. 
And see, some of us, we, we're scared about our temporary more than our eternity. And then we let opposition keep us from the opportunity. Like he's ready to lose his life for the very thing that shifted his existence. Ready to lose his life for it. Like this is an epicenter moment that alters everything. This moment right here alters history. Listen to how much more bold Paul gets. I mean, he already has lit up Festus. He's already finding common ground with Agrippa. And he says this, and King Agrippa knows about these things. I love this. He goes, I speak boldly, for I am sure that these events are, are, events are familiar to him, for they are not, they're not done in a corner. And I love King Agrippa. He's like, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. That's what Paul says. And listen to Agrippa. He goes, um, do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? Isn't that a great response? I love Paul here. He's like, you know, King Agrippa, you know, he believes in the prophets. And, and I know they're not in a corner. And King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? And I love that Agrippa's like, I see what you're doing. I'm picking up what you're throwing down, Paul. And I love Paul's response, whether quickly or not. I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am, except for these chains. I like that he even throws a little jab at him for having him in prison. He's like, I wish everything that has happened to me would happen to you. I wish that you would experience hope. I wish that you would experience transformation. I wish that you would know what has changed inside of me except for these chains. I like that that's probably a little nod to like, seriously, guys, I'm in chains right now for preaching hope. He's like, but I want all of you to have what I have in this moment. You want to talk about bold empowerment? You want to talk about an epicenter of empowerment? Paul is so convinced of the life change that has happened to him, that he drops this massive dime bag of hope on them so he can help maybe impact their life. I like that Paul can't be contained. He believes and has experienced the life change of Jesus, and now he is the epicenter of empowerment that Jesus is using. He's a shockwave. And Paul understands something we would be good to remember too. And let me free you. We save no one. We save no one. Let, let me just take the pressure off of you. You're like, man, I got to save my neighbors. No, you don't. You're like, ah, I got to save my husband. I got to save my wife. I got to save my kids. I got to save my... No, you don't. Scripture says Jesus saves, not you save. And if there's power in the name of Jesus, just let me take the pressure off of you. You don't have to save anyone. All you have to do is tell them the story of the one that saved you. All you got to do is get them in front of the one that saves. All we are tasked with doing is telling as many people as we can about the hope that empowers us to live differently. That's what we're called to. Look at verse 30. I love this. Then the king, the governor, by the way, the governor's name is Bernice. I don't know why that's funny to me. I think that's hilarious. If your name's Bernice, I'm sorry. I just think that's really funny. That, that's a biblical name. Way to go, all right? And all the others stood and left. As they went out, they talked it over, and they agreed, this man hasn't done anything to deserve death or imprisonment. And then Agrippa said to Festus, he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. Let me help you understand that. Uh, Paul is also a Roman citizen. So he knew his out was if they decided to do something dumb, he was like, I'll just appeal to Caesar. And then he has to go to Rome. He has to talk to Caesar. And here's what's great about that. If he doesn't do that, then he doesn't make it to the known world. It's amazing to me they find him innocent, by the way. It's maybe as if they feel the power of God through him. Did you sense that maybe? They're like, I don't think there's anything we can keep him here for. Then Paul appeals his case. But remember what an epicenter does. Go all the way back to that, that earthquake in, in Chile. An epicenter sends shockwaves all over the world. And if Paul had not appealed to Caesar then history as we know it may not have happened the way that it happened because he was a shockwave. If Paul is not bold, he doesn't have the opportunity to go to Rome and shake the epicenter of then the known world by empowering them with the good news of Jesus. And every time Paul faced opposition, he moves the good news forward. Every time. Every time he faced opposition, he saw it as an opportunity to move good news forward. It's by empowered in the opposition that he empowers the early church to seismically shift the world. 
by this one moment. I'll never forget standing in Rome a few years ago where Paul stood. Walking around the, the ancient areas of Rome and, and seeing where he landed on that shore. But then a few, year later, a few years later, I go to Israel. And I end up in this place called Caesarea by the Sea. I just want to show it to you on the screens. Caesarea by the Sea. That's the day we were there. And Caesarea by the Sea, uh, just a few miles up the road, about 10 miles up the road, is a place called Jaffa which maybe you've read it in scripture as Joppa. That's where uh, this guy named Jonah, remember him? We talked about him a little while back. Also the same place that Peter has a vision by this, at Simon the Tanner's house, if you've read scripture, same place. And then Paul, 10 miles down the road, this is the port that he would have left Israel to go to Rome out of. So standing here where modern day Christianity left on a ship, to go to the known world and seismically change. It started right in that spot, and now it's all the way on the other side of the globe. How does that happen? I'll tell you how it happens. is because Paul understood that he was an epicenter of empowerment by Jesus to shift the world. Now, I know we read scripture and we're like, yeah, but, but Paul must have been some superhuman. Like, was he in the metaverse? Was he a part of the, like, the Avengers? Nope. He was actually not much different than us. Yeah, he went to school. He was educated. He knew the writers of the day. But the only thing that was superhuman about Paul was the one that he served. See, all of us have an opportunity to be an epicenter of hope. Like this moment of opposition in Paul's life, if not for this opposition in Jerusalem, he would have never had the opportunity to go to Rome. And if he doesn't go to Rome, we may not have Jesus here today. And here's what we need to understand. His road to, road, uh, to Rome was one of opposition after opposition. Opposition after opposition after opposition. And if you read through the rest of chapter 27 and 28, let me give you the cliff notes. He was tossed by the sea. He was shipwrecked. He was stuck on an island. He was left for dead. He was bitten by a snake. That would have been enough for me to be out. <laughs> Yet in the midst of the opposition, God still gave Paul opportunity. Every single time. He, he's shipwrecked. He's got these guys on the ship that don't know Jesus. He's like, I'm here. Let's go. They end up on this island, and he, the shockwaves of empowering are moving this tsunami of grace around the known world with Paul. And even while he's exiled on the island... Paul has the opportunity to heal a man. And that opportunity and that opposition led to those people getting Paul to Rome. You see, he could have seen those oppositions as oppositions and maybe stayed on the island or died on a shipwreck. Instead, he was like, what's God trying to do in this moment? Who does God want me to reach on this island? Who, who does he want me to take care of with this snake on my hand? Who does he want me to take care of as the ship is going down? What can I do in this moment? Where is God wanting to use me? Because no one would have blamed him for walking away from his faith at any one of these junctures. It was hard opposition. It was one wave after another. Prison was the norm for Paul. Beatings were regular. Riots were like all the time. His life was always in danger. The opposition was great. But here's what Paul understood. The shockwaves of grace were greater. He knew he was called to help people find hope. In eternity. And where most people would see a great opposition, Paul saw a great opportunity. Every single time. Does that mean it wasn't hard? I wasn't with Paul at night when he's laying in bed going, man, oh gosh, God, are you serious? One more storm, one more shipwreck, one more riot, one more prison. But here's what I love. Is Saul's conversion in his mind was the 9.5 epicenter. The fact that God could use him to be a shockwave of empowerment across the world. See, he understood opposition is our opportunity. He understood it. Like, do you realize how much harder it was for Paul to get on a boat and go around the world the way that he did? How much harder it was, just the opposition alone of having to get on a boat and go to a place you've never been. To get on a boat and sail in like the first century versus today. 
where I get alerts from American Airlines when there's bad weather and I can divert and get home sooner. He didn't have that luxury. And yet he still went. See, he understood that Jesus is the epicenter of power in opposition. So what about you? Do you ever feel like the opposition in your life is relentless? Do you ever feel that way? I, I don't know if you've ever said this. Like, seriously, again? You ever said that? Like, like my wife, literally yesterday, like we've had like these little things in our life over the last couple months that you're just like, seriously? Dumb things, right? Things with movers. Like we've been here for like five months. We're still dealing with claims with our moving company. And every day I'm just like, seriously? Or, or like... Like, I've got a daughter 1,900 miles away in college, and if she gets sick or something happens, we're like, seriously, we can't even be there? Really? And that's not big opposition. That's just a little opposition. But do you ever just feel like there's this relentless opposition on your life? Or do you ever wonder why you keep going? You ever have that moment? I've had those moments in the last year of my life. I've had those moments where I'm like, God, do I just need to do something else? God, do you really want me to, to keep going? And I'm always reminded when I have those moments that coming to Jesus is not declaring peace on the enemy. Coming to know Jesus is declaring war. We're, we're not declaring peace on the enemy. We're declaring war, war for souls, wars for grace, war for hope, war for transformation and redemption. The enemy is going to do anything and everything to keep you from having an impact. In fact, you know the greatest way is complacency. That if Satan can get you to the place where you just don't care, and you just go, you know what, what good am I? Satan will go, all right, good, I got one more. Complacency is the greatest work of the enemy. But, but I would be so bold as to say that if you're not experiencing opposition, then you're not really a threat to the enemy. Because the enemy says that he's looking to seek and kill and destroy. But what if we didn't see our opposition as opposition? What if you saw every opposition as an opportunity? What if we saw roadblocks as redemption avenues instead? Because all I know is this. Every time my family has faced a massive opposition, God has always led us to greater opportunities. Every time. And I don't have time to unpack all of the crazy opposition my family in the last 24 years of ministry has faced. But can I tell you, every time we face one, God's given us a greater opportunity. Like the greatest opportunity right now for my family is that we live in the 12th largest unchurched city in America. The greatest opportunity that God has given my family is that I get to do life with this family at Pantano. And as a family, we can rise up above the opposition and see an opportunity in our city for people to know the hope in the name of Jesus. That's what he's called us to. Because I always know we must, we must be a threat to the enemy when the opposition shows up. That's how I know. When the enemy starts lurking around, I'm like, oh, we must be up to something. God must be trying to do something. So let me ask you, what's your greatest opposition? Maybe you're thinking, oh, it's work. Opportunity. You're thinking, no, 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 it's, it's my home. If you just knew my home, opportunity. Ah, it's school. If you, just, if you just knew this professor I had or this teacher I had or these people in my class, God's like, an opportunity. Ah, it's my neighbor. If you just met that neighbor, like that, that neighbor has run off more neighbors than any neighbors can comprehend. Opportunity. See, epicenters have power. And the greatest epicenter of power, I'm going to go back to it, is in one name. The name of Jesus. Have you proclaimed Jesus over your work? Have you proclaimed Jesus over your home? Have you proclaimed Jesus over your school or over your neighbor or, or wherever it is that you're finding opposition? Have you just declared and proclaimed Jesus over those things? Some of you are thinking, ah, it's my health. Opportunity. It's my addiction. Opportunity. Have you declared Jesus in those things? So I'm going to ask you one more time. 
I know we did it already, but I, I've, I've talked for a long time now, so it's your turn. And so I'm just going to go back to where we started with the power in the name of the one named Jesus. And this time, I, I want it to come from a new place. Like down here, that guttural response of Jesus. Because if you really believe that there's power over your home, there's power over your work, there's power over your school, there's power over your community, over your neighborhood, over the places you frequent, over your county, over your state, over our country, over this globe, that you can actually make a seismic shift in a shockwave with the very name of Jesus being proclaimed, then we've got to shout it from the rooftops. So on the count of three... I just want to do something with you one more time. And I want you to utter the name of Jesus like you've never uttered it before. That it would send a shockwave maybe 11,000 miles away. That it would touch the shores on the other side of the globe. And maybe, just maybe, change the lives of the people around you. So on the count of three. One, two, three. Y'all, that's Richter scale kind of stuff. <laughs> so what happens when the church sees opposition as opportunity? Well, I'll tell you what happens. We become an epicenter of empowerment that sends shock waves and tsunamis of grace into our community. And so I'm going to leave you with an action today. By the way, if you're new to Pantano, everybody has a next step. Everybody. Every single one of us have a next step. But next week, we've got one of my favorite events we do here, which is Serve Our City. And actually, next weekend, if you show up in here to come do this, we will not be here. <laughs> You're going to have a grand old time just hanging out in here, drinking your coffee, chilling. You'll have to bring your own coffee because we're not giving it to you in here next week, all right? <laughs> but actually, I love Serve Our City because I actually call it a worship service. We're going to worship by our service. We're going to go into our communities all over the city of Tucson. There are, I mean, just dozens of areas that we're going to serve our community. Some of them will be right here on campus. If you're looking for a place to go next week, we'll have stuff. We can direct you here. I would encourage you, though, today, do me a favor. I want you to text the word CONNECT. Take out your device, text the word CONNECT to 46356. You can still sign up for Serve Our City today. But beyond today, um, we'll have to figure it out, all right? But all of us should have a desire to go be an epicenter of empowerment through just, this is an easy way to start. To become a shockwave in our community next weekend as we send thousands of people around our community to serve people with that name of Jesus. And if you're here today and you're like, I, I don't even know about all this other stuff, uh, you can still text that word CONNECT to 46356. And it will give you all your instructions on what to do next. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you need to go to starting point. Maybe you need to go to launching point. You don't know what any of those things are. Text the word CONNECT to 46356 and find out what your next step may be here at Pantano. But we would love to have you next weekend be a part of Serve Our City. You can text that word CONNECT to 46356. Sign up. Get to be a part of a project. we got them all over the city, not just on the southeast side all over the city that you can be a part of. But I want to pray a prayer of blessing and empowerment over you today, if that's okay. So if you get on your feet, I want to pray for you. And then I'm going to send you as a shockwave into the community this week. Let's pray. Father, today, God, our, our prayer in this moment, God, is that the epicenter of power, the 9.5 epicenter of power today, right here in this place, would send shockwaves into our community. God, that if we go to eat after this, that we'd send shockwaves to our servers. God, that if we go into our neighborhoods today and, and go for walks, we would send shockwaves into our neighbors. God, that maybe we would just maybe take meals across the street or cookies or, or just knock on a door and ask how we can pray for somebody or just begin to start a conversation. God, maybe we just walk into work tomorrow and we begin to sit down at our desk and proclaim Jesus in that place that we would utter your name everywhere we go. God, that, that we don't have to be with a bullhorn on a corner, but God, we can, we can walk in and we can just utter your name. Just Jesus, and it'll change the world. God, I, I pray that any opposition we have in life right now, we would see as an opportunity. God, shift us from being opposed to being opportune for the kingdom. God, I pray for each family. I pray for each individual. I pray for each marriage. I pray for each single. I pray for each and every person hearing this online or in this room. 
God, that we would see shock waves popping up all over the globe because of the name of Jesus in our lives. God, transform us, move us, and give us opportunities even in the next few moments today. We love you. It's your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. We love you all. Have a great week. We'll see you right back here.